the angel and the demon meet in the air. Beneath the sky, the color of blood, drawing breaths the taste of murder. The first impact of a blade against blade is a metallic thundercrack, while their sons wage war below, fighting and dying in the shadows of their father's wings. The Lord of the Red Sand swings and the Black Blade shrieks its steel fattened on souls. But the angel is gone, twisting away, soaring higher. Angron beats his wings, giving chase, enraged at his own cumbersome strength. It's like fighting a shadow. Each time he closes on Sanguinius, the angel rolls aside or furls his wings and drops away. Each missed swing of his sword, each failed grasp with his talons, resonates inside Angron's skull with a splash of acid. The nails bite to give him strength. This is so, but they also bite to punish him. Now, more than ever, the nails bite with the sound of Horus's urgent command begging for the angel's death. Angron, what little is left of Angron, now that his soul has been transmogrified into the flesh matter of an ethereal god, has never heard Horus beg before. The weakness in the War Master's voice makes him shudder with revulsion. Sanguinius dives low, swooping towards the ground, and Angron follows. Volkite beams stab up at them both, lancing the sky. They fly through detonations that blacken the angel's armor and darken his wings. Explosions that do nothing but tighten the demon's hold on incarnation. Every death taking place upon this planet, every life ending beneath them, strengthens Angron and seals his wounds. Closer, he comes closer. He can smell the sweat on his brother's skin. He can hear the drumbeat of his brother's blood. He can smell the sweetness of the angel's wounds. Thanguinius senses it. The angel veers away with a grace Angron cannot hope to match. A spread of feathered wings arrests his dive and a slash of straight silver rips across the demon's face. There is no pain. Most of his face has been cut from his skull, but there is no pain. He experiences pain the way others might feel grief, or trauma, or frustration. To him, it is a helplessness, a wound within. It is something that cannot be tolerated, something that can only be overcome with the running of enemy blood. He's blind his face broken by the silver sword, and without the organic receptors to process injury, it's the weakness that hurts. His eyes regenerate as he thrashes blindly with his blade. He can see again, dull and dim for another few moments, then, with a clarity that defeats the ash and dust swirling in the air. He doesn't see as a human sees, Angron sees the fire of souls, and his brother's flares brightest of all. When they meet again, it's in a killing embrace. The Lord of the Red Sands tears the angel from the sky, clutching his golden brother in his great claws, bearing Sanguinius down. They fall, and fall, and fall, and crash through the glacaic dome of the Martian temple atop the warmonger titan Malax Meridius. They strike the floor in a roar that would break any mortal bones, their tumbling bodies obliterating the mosaic rendering of the Opus Machina, the sacred icon of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Martian Mechanicum alike. This is a sacrilege neither brother notices. Tech priests and menials flee the dueling demigods. Neither of them notices that, either. Angron gets a clawed hand around the angel's head. He beats Sanguinius' skull against the floor once, twice, thrice. 
and cracks web out along the tiles in stone-splitting veins. A fourth time, a fifth. There is weakness, then. Perhaps it should be pain as well, but it is most definitely weakness. Angron's grip slackens, his arm dissolves. Literally, it dissolves from the shoulder down, and the Lord of the Red Sands is thrown back as the angel rises. In Sanguinius' hands is a pistol, and the dregs of Angron's sentience recognize this as the melter weapon Infernus, a one-use thing of incineration. The angel casts it aside and takes wing, diving right at the demon, leading with his sword. Angron raises his own blade, feeling the flow of the incoming blows like promises whispered in warning, and he catches each of the angel's thrusts before they can impact against him. Metal grinds, sparks spray arcing out from the meeting blades, hypnotic in their falling beauty. For a moment, just a moment, he is on the plains of Deshrazen, camping rough beneath the pale moon, watching fireflies play above the banked campfires of his freed slave army. How peaceful that night had been, even with the nails knuckling into the back of his brain. How peaceful that one night was before the Emperor tore him away from his real brothers and sisters, the siblings of his heart and not of manufactured blood, leaving them to fight alone, leaving them to die, leaving him to face this unwanted life and... Sanguinius impales him. A lance of ice runs through where his heart should be. The two brothers are face to face, one of them a visage of bloodied human perfection, the other a construct of absolute inhumanity, rage made manifest. As close as they are, despite the changes to Angron's vision, he sees the tiredness etched on the angel's features, the faint cuts and scratches that the Battle of Terror has written onto Sanguinius's flesh, indelibly marking him. This war has rendered the perfect imperfect. Die, Sanguinius tells him, with the gentleness of giving a great gift. I free you from this torment. Angron's lips peel back in the memory of a smile. He tries to speak. Speaking is difficult, not because he is dying, but because he is no longer a creature for whom speaking is a natural or necessary process. Speech is an echo from a lost life. The Lord of the Red Sands expresses himself in slavering roars and the death of his foes. Sanguinius sees this, sees the way Hangron's face twists, trying to remember how to form words, sees that the demon is not dying. The Lord of the Red Sands moves, but the angel is faster. Sanguinius tears the blade free and leaps upward, taking to the sky, bleeding, laughing, the demon follows. They swoop between the temple towers that rise from the back of Malax Meridius. They break away into open sky. Sanguinius is slower in the open, but he is built for this. He is graceful and experienced and born for aerial warfare. Angron has the unreal strength of demonic muscle, but he is a gargoyle chasing a hawk. Sanguinius weaves and soars and dives out of his clutches, and... Kill him! Horus invades the demon's mind. The words are bloated by the pantheon, ripe with the borrowed power of the gods. Behind those words is the promise of pain, 
true pain. Nails pain. The Lord of the Red Sands beats his wings harder, his sword leaving a trailing wake of screaming souls, the dead of terror singing their song. They race low to the ground, hardy in arms reach above the heads of their warring sons, fast enough that their armies are an indistinct blur. Angron swings the black blade. He gouges earth, he sends blood angels and world eaters tumbling across the ground, their bodies destroyed, their souls spilling into the warp's million waiting moors. Without warning, Sanguinius climbs, soars. This is your chance, what you are born and reborn for. The Lord of the Red Sands ignores Horus's puling. He senses Sanguinius tiring and sees it in the flicker of his soul fire. His brother's spirit ripples with the desperate sweetness of exhaustion. The war. The battlement. The bane of the Ninth Bloodline. Yes. The angel's strength is running dry. The demon gathers speed, flying into the polluted wind while anti-air fire stitches the air around him. Sanguinius weaves aside from the blinding slashes of Laz cannon beams, rolls away from the juddering passage of a legion stormbird. Angron, far less maneuverable, crashes into it, goes through it, tastes the flavor of those doomed souls as their craft comes apart around them. It is nothing to him, the expenditure of a breath's worth of effort. Behind him, the stormbird falls from the sky, its hull aflame and cleaved in two. The largest piece of its structure will tumble against the side of the Sanctum Imperialis, detonating against the thickest void shields ever created. Wreckage will rain upon the warriors of both sides. Angron knows none of this. We'll never know it. Do not fail me, Angron. The babbling of a frightened creature, speaking as though it were in control. The Lord of the Red Sands pays it no heed. They dive through the death cloud of a falling titan, into black smoke and the white fire of plasma. The billowing smoke cannot hide the light of the angel's soul. Angron is close, close. Close enough that he parts his jaws to reveal uneven rows of mismatched teeth that jut up from pleading gums. As they circle into this burning, choking sphere that only burns and chokes one of them, the demon gives a draconic roar. The sound is exultant and instinctive. It is unfiltered emotion and it reeks more of triumph than rage. Angron's mouth is still open when the spear, hurled from the angel's left hand, strikes. It shatters most of the demon's teeth, severs his tongue at the throat root and punches through the back of his head, with the cervical segments of his spine reduced to ectoplasmic chunks. Angron falls, boneless, stunned from the sky. The angel twists in the smoke and follows his brother down. Angron hits the royal ascension with the cratering force at the heart of the two warring legions. His impact kills almost a hundred warriors on both sides, but this is another concern outside the shreds of his sentience. The surviving world eaters cheer him through the dust. They bay at him like loyal hounds but he knows nothing outside his own fury. He claws at the spear. He roars around its impaling length. In those helpless seconds, he's beast stupid in sound and action, thrashing in the dirt. The lance comes free, slick with Icor pretending to be blood. Gobbets of demonic flesh sizzling on its silver surface. Already the demon is reforming, re-knitting, sustained by whatever metaphysical processes fuel his existence. 
the Lord of the Red Sands throws the weapon away, in time to meet its wielder. The angel descends with a silence that stinks of false righteousness, as though he were a creature too enlightened to feel rage. Brothers collide in the crater they made. Around them, the battle for the Eternity Gate rages. The World Eaters are coming. The World Eaters and the Life Takers and the Bloodletters. Sanguinius senses them draw near. Hears their howling. Angron sees this awareness dawn in his brother's eyes. Sanguinius hacks and hacks as the snarls of chain axes and demon blades grow louder. It isn't enough. The angel launches away, a crack of his wings carrying him upward. The Lord of the Red Sands knows he can't catch Sanguinius in the sky. He scrambles for the fallen spear, draws it back, and this time there is no chase. This time Angron is ready. He throws the spear, still slathered in ichor from when he tore it out of his own throat. The second he casts it, it rips through the air with a concussive drumbeat, breaking the sound barrier. The angel rolls aside with the grace of the Skyborn, dodging the streak of bladed intent. No, Angron sees, not dodging. Faster than the human eye can follow, the angel has caught his spear as it passed, rolled with momentum and now he casts it back to the ground with a cry of effort. Angron will catch it, this twig of a thing, and he clutches nothing but air, and the force of a meteor hits him in the chest, throwing him down, pinning him to the warped, stained ground. For several unreal seconds, the Lord of the Red Sands is impaled in place, speared through the chest. There is no pain, only humiliation. He frees himself in time to see Sanguinius ascending, leaving him behind. His wounds close, but slower, slower, slower than before. The nails bite harder, despising his weakness. Angron turns his back on his brother, seeking the lesser blood angels in Legion Red. He wades through them, ending them, sending their bones flying back with heaving swings of his soul-thirsty sword. If he cannot catch the angel, he will lure the angel back to him. He learned this from the Bane. It takes no time at all. Angron has scarcely begun to shed blood before he hears the descending beat of angelic wings. The Lord of the Red Sands wipes the writhing bodies of dying blood angels from where they're spitted upon his blade, and turns to meet his brother once more. Bolt shells impact against him, chainswords carve into the unmeat of his legs. He ignores this. The pitiful defiance of his nephews with their bolters and chainswords. He will kill them and devour them and offer up their skulls to the skull throne. Yes, but now, first, the angel must die. The brothers go at one another, sword to sword. They are a blur to the mortals around them. So swift are the clashes of their blades that their swords sing a single extended note. A lasting ring without crescendo or diminuendo. It is beautiful. That ululating chime, a masterpiece of broken physics. But only one of them is immortal. Sanguinius, failed by mortal muscle, weakened by the war, begins to slow. His thrusts become deflections, his hacks shift to parries. He gives ground, at first by centimeters, then with greater steps. Through eyes tense with effort, he sees that he's being driven back towards the violated Eternity Gate. 
the Lord of the Red Sand sees it dawn on the angel's face. How the longer they fight, the weaker only one of them becomes. In the searing thresh that passes for Angron's mind, he knows it will come any moment now when desperation will force his brother's hand. Planes clash, they clash, they clash, and clash, and clash, and then... Angron lets the silver sword run through him, taking it inside his demonic corpus as a sacrifice. He uses the blow, feeding off of the pain and craving the damage, because it lets him get closer. Ooze bubbles through the cage of his teeth, the ectoplasm that animates him running from his body in a flow of lifeblood. But no matter. It's worth it. Taloned hand snaps around the angel's throat. The other thrusts forward with his blade. Sanguinius jerks as the sword slides with miserable slowness into his guts. His perfect features darken with pain, and the Lord of the Red Sands feeds on that sight. Feeds on the angel's bearing of teeth feeds on the stink of Sanguinius's rich, running blood. The sensation is narcotic, intoxicatingly pure. Even the god of war, in whose shadow Angron stands, bays with pleasure at the shedding of this being's blood. Angron's grip tightens on the angel's throat. He thrusts the blade deeper, growling at the fresh flow of blood that bursts from his brother's mouth. Sanguinius's mouth works, but at first, no words come forth. All he manages to breathe out is his brother's name. Brother! It is a struggle for Angron to speak but a lifetime of bitterness is dredged with the agony in his brother's beautiful eyes. He sinks the blade deeper into the angel's body, hilting it in his brother's guts, and draws Sanguinius in until they are face to face. He's close enough to smell the blood on his brother's breath. He's close enough for it to spatter against his face. Angron. No sound in life has ever been sweeter than his flawless, beloved exemplar brother, hissing his name in strangulation. Angron's jaws are poorly shaped for human speech, but the Lord of the Red Sands forces the words from his maw. Hark! The dying angel sings. Sanguinius reaches for him with weak and clawless hands. It's pathetic. The performance of a weakling. The Lord of the Red Sands doesn't need to breathe. He cares nothing if his brother's hands find their way around his throat. But the sweetness is fading. The adrenal rush drains away. Is this truly how the angel dies? Is this all the fight Sanguinius has left in his celebrated form? Angron! Horus, the War Master, the coward, in orbit. The Lord of the Red Sands hears the voice break through his ecstatic haze and senses Horus has been seeking to reach his blood-soaked mind for some time. There is derision in the War Master's presence. But above all, there is fear. Release him! Release him! 
He is sanguineous reaching hands close on a fistful of the cranial cables that crown Angron's head. The angel grips the technological dreadlocks that form the external regulators of the butcher's nails, and the beast that Angron has become realizes too late. Much too late. The angel has played the same gambit, risking a blade, welcoming it to get close. Kill him before the words cease to exist. Replaced by pain. Real pain. A thing he thought he was incapable of experiencing, now stunning in its unfamiliar savagery. The Lord of the Red Sands gives a roar loud enough that the Sanctum's void shields shimmer where the mirages ripple. He tears his blade from his brother's body, grappling, hurling, but the angel remains. White wings batter at the demon's face and defeat the raking of his claws. He abandons his own blade to scratch and scrape at the angel. He tears away shards of golden armor. Wings bleed, feathers rain. Never once does Sanguinius make a sound. Angron cries out, a cry flavored by something other than rage for the first time since his exaltation. Agony lightning bolts through his head. Fire and ice, ice and fire, a sensation he no longer has the mind to understand, but that will destroy him, whether he understands it or not. He launches upwards, beating his ungainly wings, striving for the sky, turning and tumbling, seeking to dislodge the straining angel. On the battlefield below, the legions duel in the reign of their Primarch's blood. The Lord of the Red Sands, Angron. I remember. I remember now. I am Angron! Feels his skull creaking, stretching, then a crack. A crack that paints the back of his eyes with acid. It's the cracking of a slowly breaking window. The crack of a skull under a tank's treads. He hears his brother now. Sanguinius's ragged hisses of breath coming in time to the scrape of his gauntlet against the pain engine's mechanical tendrils. Their eyes meet, and there is no mercy in the angel's pale gaze. Sanguinius is lost to the passions he has always resisted. The Lord of the Red Sand sees it in the pinpricks of his brother's pupils, in the ivory grind of his brother's fangs. The angel has lost himself to blood need, and veins show starkly blue on his cheeks. This is wrath. This is the angel unleashed. It is an anger so absolute, Angron feels the bite of another forgotten emotion. Jealousy. What he sees in the angel's eyes is no bitter fury at a life of mistreatment or rage goaded by the will of a god that only rewards slaughter. It feeds the god of war, as all bloodshed does, but it is not born of him. It is the angel's own fury, in worship of nothing but justice. How beautiful that is. How naive. How pure. This is the demon's last cohesive thought. Fueled by animal panic as much as sentient rage, Angron's frantic clawing does nothing to throw Sanguinius clear. The brothers fall together, the demon's strength lost to convulsive thrashing. 
the angel's ripped and blood-stained wings unable to keep them both aloft. The dreadlock cables are fastened deep in the meat of the monster's mind. They are not attached to the brain. They are part of it. Tendrilling their way through the pain engine that replaced and so poorly simulated entire sections of the twelfth Primarch Cerebellum, Thalamus, and Hypothalamus. The butcher's nails are woven throughout his brainstem, hammered in to bind them to the spinal column and central nervous system. It is a process almost admirable in its barbaric effectiveness. One reproduced with malignant perfection in his exaltation from a mortal to an immortal. From behind the veil, Angron hears laughter. A god laughing at him. Because it cares not from whence the blood flows. The death of the Lord of the Red Sands is as pleasing to this divinity as the death of any other champion. Warp fire flares from the cracks in the beast's deforming skull. The cracks become crunches, each one a conflagration that sweeps from the filaments behind Angron's eyes to the spikes of his spine. There is the feeling of violation, a deep and slick wrongness as something is taken from him, pulled from the root of his mind. He screams then, and he does something he has never done in neither his mortal nor immortal lives. His roar of pained rage is colored by a sound so shameful he will spend the rest of eternity refusing to believe it happened. The sound is a word, and the word is a plea. He begs. No! The beast grunts to his brother. This moment will never enter the legends of either legion. The Primarchs are high above the battlefield, and the few sons able to watch their fathers are too far away to know what passes between them. Only Sanguinius hears Angron's last word and it is an intimacy he will take to his grave. The ground rises with disorienting speed. It's now or never. As they free fall together, the angel gives a final, wrenching pull of the serpents of barbarian metal. The demon's head bursts. It's a detonation. A release of internal pressure like pus from a squeezed cyst. The lion's share of Angron's brain comes free in a spray of fire and acid blood. The demon's wings beat once more. Just a shiver, a thing of reflex. His claws slacken. All struggles cease.